Pretty action-packed video intro for you today. You can see we're moving at quite a pace, just out uh, walking the dog again. Once again, taking the opportunity to record a personality-laden intro for this video. She stopped. For this video, this time the subject is... Atlanta Falcons. Thanks, voice. Did the Amiga love the Mega Drive? I think it probably did, yes. It was an unrequited thing, though, in which Sega's console didn't really share the affection thrown its way by Commodore's computer. Games were ported one to the other in each direction, but it was mainly a one-way thing, with most things coming from Mega Drive to Amiga. But not always. There were games made for the Amiga that stood out as a bit different, titles not especially taking advantage of the format's USPs, instead aiming to ape the cool kids of the era, the consoles. It came as little surprise then to see most of these console copying games make the leap from Amiga to the Mega Drive, with the computer determined to impress upon the console that it was capable, it was able, it was deserving of love. So with that brain mess in my brain, I decided to take a look at some of the more notable console-like games developed for the Amiga and their subsequent Mega Drive ports. They were mostly notable for being failures or just ignored. Hooray! Operation Wolf, then Altered Beast, then Wolf Child. The evolution of lichen representation in games. Well, that and some classic 80s world policing from the US. I don't think there were many werewolves in Operation Wolf. Anyway, Wolf Child, a platformer where you turn into a wolf with a lovely sampled howl, riddled with delightful parallax scrolling smooth of animation, and thoroughly console-like in its presentation in the world of Amiga games where everything was usually about fiddling with statistics or reading dry prose concerning the Cold War. Wolf Child stood out on its home format, that's for sure. When Wolf Child came to the Mega Drive, and other consoles I should point out, it was completely lost in the mix. The port itself was absolutely fine, little about it I can think of that was a glaring nadger up, maybe the sound on the Mega Drive version lacked a bit of the Amiga's lovely sampled nature and some other graphical stuff people would pretend to care about, but nothing glaring. The big difference though was one we'll see popping up again and again in this video. What was standout on the Amiga for being console-like was rarely anything more than an also-ran in the world of consoles. When you have an array of wonderful platformers already on your machine, a decent but unspectacular addition to the library changes little, even if it is a better Wolfman game than Altered Beast. Say hello to Case in Point, just without the wolves. Zool had all the hype in the world behind it around its launch on the Amiga, with all manner of magazines, Galaxy Brain tier Amiga Power included, hailing it as a sonic killer and one of the best platformers ever made. And you know what? When you look at Zool on the Amiga specifically, when you're a monoformat brained animal, when you compare it to the Super Frogs and Fire and Isis of the world, it is something different. I'd even argue it's something special in that respect, and it's definitely something unique. Fast, smooth, creative, bright, drawing inspiration from console platformers, but not outright ripping them off. Zool was a fantastic mix of the sort of game you got on other formats, as well as a decidedly Amiga-ish game. Like I said, say hello to Case in Point, a decidedly Amiga-ish game that also plays like platformers on the consoles doesn't work out so well on consoles. Again, I'm looking at the Mega Drive version here, but Zool released on pretty much all other consoles of the day and made little to no impact on any of them at all. When you make something and push it as a Sonic beater, then actually release it on the format Sonic calls home, you'd better have some trousers backing up the mouth. Zool had chopper chops and not much else. Jumping to consoles didn't make it a worse game, it just showed why and how it wasn't ever that special in a macro context to begin with. I always pictured this very differently in my head before playing it, maybe getting it mixed up with something like First Samurai, because Leander's art is not really reflected in the in-game graphics. 
Still, it was a fun combat platformer, parallax scrolling up the wazoo as you'd expect for an Amiga game, and a nice blend of action and light RPG elements. Basically, as you might have guessed from the theme of this list, if you're behaving and paying attention, it was a console-like game on the Amiga, and as such it got many a plaudit thrown its way in its original incarnation. First thing to change when you bring it to console? The name, obviously. Leander is too wishy-washy. Those illiterate fool owners of the Mega Drive need something from their pulpy stories of heroism they actually know, not the Greek tale of lust, love, and tragedy. The legend of Galahad was born instead. Then, when the game went over to the States, it became just Galahad, because the other title's too wordy? God, I don't know. Look, this is a roundabout way of getting to the fact that this was another fine conversion of a genuinely good console-like Amiga game. And again, it was lost to the ether because everyone was staring mouth agape at Echo the Dolphin or some such tomfoolery. Whether he's known as Leander or Galahad, and whether it's a legend of him or not, he failed on his trip to Mega Drive Town. The original Wacky Racers, at least if you ignore the existence of the original Wacky Racers, as well as this game's own predecessor, Super Skid Marks brought together a funny name, Skid Marks are poo stains in your pants, the ability to race around tracks as cows on wheels, and the other ability to attach caravans to your cows or any other vehicle you were driving. It was a hodgepodge of content decades before that word left such a bitter taste in the mouth. I mean, content, not hodgepodge. And in multiplayer was an absolute laugh riot, or lorio, as nobody's ever said, of a time. For some reason I will never understand, it did indeed earn itself a Codemasters developed port to Sega's console of the day. This one didn't translate well to the Mega Drive, I would say, for a few reasons. The main one is obviously the technical limitations imposed by the Mega Drive when put next to the hugely superior A1200 version, the latter able to play high res with eight vehicles and most players in different cars, just for an example. But it also didn't translate very well as a bit of a cultural thing. The original Skid Marks was very much a project born of a group of people dicking about in the PD or demo scenes, and Super Skid Marks was a continuation of that theme. It was rough around the edges, not a polished production at all, and really felt at home on the Amiga with its loose amalgamation of bedroom coders, naughty crack scene kids, and ex-copy toting kids. Mega Drive owners were used to a cleaner package, something crafted to be street ready, not jumbled together and sent out with the instruction to work it out yourself, but a complete thing made to be enjoyed with the minimum of effort, like say, micro machines. It was still good, great even, on the Mega Drive, but Super Skid Marks was the wrong game on the wrong platform in this instance. Time to flip reverse in the finest of Blazing Squad traditions. Wiz and Liz was actually made for the Mega Drive and ported to the Amiga, but in a peculiar twist of fate has actually ended up being a game associated more with the computer than the console. And I think that comes down to the entire topic at hand here. As far as I'm aware, both versions came out pretty much the same day, maybe give or take a few weeks, so there was no hype in bringing it from one platform to the other like there was with Zool, say. As such, a lot of Amiga-owning folks, like young Bransfield, saw it as an Amiga game first and foremost. A big part of the reason why was because, and yes, it's broken record sounding time again, Wiz and Liz wasn't really a barn burner on the Mega Drive. It was enjoyed by those who played it, because it was brilliant, but it was ignored by the mouth-breathing masses, as these things tended to be on the console. The Amiga, meanwhile, was still starved for genuinely good console-like games, so we all lapped it up eagerly and gave this inventive mix of bunny rescuing and high-speed spell mixing the love it deserved. The result? A classic Amiga console-like game that was actually made with the Mega Drive in mind. Seriously though, great game, look it up. To say Battle Squadron was loved on the Amiga is like saying I should have more subscribers on this channel. It's an obvious, truthful statement that at the same time massively underplays the injustice of me not being YouTube's biggest star. I lost my train of thought there. Right, yeah, Battle Squadron was a vertical scrolling shmup in the vein of so many arcade and console titles of the 80s, and it worked pretty darn well on the Amiga, which was a rarity. As such, it was absolutely beloved by those who did have a pop at it, to the point that one magazine reviewing the game gave it 
109%. I mean, they shot themselves in the foot there by previously giving Xenon 2 100%, but that's just a whole other level of were to contend with. So, what happened when Battle Squadron was ported to the Mega Drive? If you guessed, it faded instantly from view, you win another prize! There was already so much on Sega's machine that was as good as and better than Battle Squadron, so, yet again, this was a case of something making the leap and almost immediately wishing it hadn't. It was a good game though, really it was, it just failed to make itself known on the Mega Drive. Battle Squadron was actually brought back to mobile platforms not that long ago, so you can quite easily check it out there if you want to see why a game received the definitely not stupid score of 109%. I always wondered what the beautiful native language Spanish title of Risky Woods could be before it was so brutally mangled into English. Turns out it was just called Risky Woods and there was no explanation for the game's weird title beyond it was a weird title. Anyway, a gorgeous platformer with puzzle and RPG elements threaded through its core experience, Bosque Rias Goso, as it wasn't called, managed to offer a mix of the technical nous the Amiga was capable of pumping out, combined with some smooth flowing action. Oh, and a hell of a chunk of difficulty. It was a mainstay of Amiga best of lists, well, except for my own, but what can you do, and rightly took its place as one of the most impactful and influential titles on Commodore's machine. And so, the port! Well, this one at least had more done to it than the usual nips and tucks needed to make something successfully jump from the Amiga to the Mega Drive. That being tweaks to the actual design of the game. Thing was, that chunk of difficulty mentioned was what we call too hard for humans. A lot of games were back then, don't get me wrong, but this one was at least a case where it was acknowledged and then fixed on its way to another format. As such, the Mega Drive version of Risky Woods maintains the general style of the Amiga original, as well as the superbly rubbish name, but tweaks things to make it less maddeningly shitty to you, the player. That's the exact sort of thing that should happen in a port, and Risky Woods was, in this respect, a resounding success. And what about in the other respect? Was it successful at being a success from a success standpoint? As the narrator might say, it was not. Another title from Raising Hell. Fun fact, the studio became Bizarre Creations, creator of the Project Gotham and Geometry Wars series. The Killing Game Show capitalised on the popular sci-fi trope of the era. The game show that involved killing. It's not a very subtle title on the Amiga, to be honest. Story-wise, you're a man's torso in a cybernetic suit, fighting for survival in the world's greatest show, which is gruesome and cool in equal measure. But in actual fact, there's very little game showy about the whole thing. What there is, between the lolloping about, jumping and shooting, is a wonderful replay mechanic when you die. On being reborn, you automatically go about doing everything you just did, in order, until the point that you died. You can fast forward through it to get to a certain point, then take over the controls and remake your destiny. It was an excellent mechanic in a usually stale genre, and while the game as a whole didn't stand up to in-depth scrutiny, it did more than enough to make it an Amiga legend. Fast forward, there's a pun, to the Mega Drive release and you ended up with fewer levels, worse looks and a title that was… actually better, I'd say. Fatal Rewind is far subtler, even if it did only come about because the word killing is bad or something and you can only use it for the title of a Mega Drive game if it's the Japanese version. So yes, an inventive, atmospheric and all-round decent shooter platform, ported to the Mega Drive and given a better title. And it was a huge success! I mean. It wasn't, but sometimes we all want to live in a fantasy land. There's a list for you. Thanks for watching, don't forget to subscribe and share and all that stuff I've forgotten to ask you to do for the last bunch of videos. Bye!